probably like the society in general, uh, everything that's related to Malaysia, we'll, we'll talk about it. And yeah, we do, we do demonstrations as well and protests as well. And in that, um, that same breath, we are in solidarity with our friends who were um, protesting yesterday under Pankap, Malaysian official one. If you guys are familiar with that, there's, a, there's plenty of support back home and we stand in solidarity with them. So for today, um, I would like to introduce Wendy Fuzia Saleh. She's an MP for one time, uh, for two terms, not 2008 and 2013. Uh, she has been involved in Kuantan in so much variety of ways. She's a grassroots campaigner, she's an activist, she's an environmental activist, very, very um, involved in the anti linus campaign and the bauxite mining as well, so we'll talk a bit more on that. But we'll also have time to talk about more like political issues um, in Malaysia in the broader sense. We do have two hours, well, one and a half hours, two, two hours uh, to talk about a lot of things. So if you guys do have questions, this is very informal. We don't really have a set um, format. So if you guys do have questions um, while we're talking, just raise your hand and we'll just allow time to just have a conversation with each other. Um, yeah, so just a couple of announcements before that. We do have a toilet just right at the end. So please do um, go if you like it. And we also have a new publication. It's called Things to Know, Working While Studying. It's um, published by us and University of Melbourne because we also um, engage ourselves with uh, student welfare here and as most of you know there's been a steady rise of exploitation of international students. Um, the one in Sydney happened with MAMA where they had to pay compensation for underpaying international students as low as $10. So this is something that we're doing as well uh, apart from the discussions that we have like today. So we'll talk about um, anti linus and about some mining and in Kuantan first of all. And probably just to kick off uh, YB Fuzia, probably we can start about talking about the environmental issues in Kuantan pre linus probably like what happened before, what was the conditions then, and then we'll start talking about um, post linus as well. So let's give her a round of applause. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon. I'd like to congratulate uh, Malaysian Program Seminozi for organizing this event. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be with you. Thank you for sharing a Sunday afternoon with, uh, with me. Uh, hoping to, I'm hoping to share uh, whatever your concerns are about Malaysia. Um, of course, the topic is about liners and bauxite and environmental. Uh, but uh, it can be, we can address other issues in the question and answer. Um, I think environmental issue is something which is very new in Malaysia. Mm. Our environmental laws are very lax. We have the EQA, the Environmental Quality Act. <coughs> However, it has many loopholes and uh, it has a lot of weaknesses. Um, most of the time, uh, leaders do not raise issues of environment. It is, uh, most, most politicians don't talk about environment. It is considered something very... very it is not gung-ho, you know, it is not... Um, it doesn't give you that aid as a politician. They prefer to talk about economics or defense. Whatever, you know, people... People, people prefer to talk about that, and most politicians don't talk about environment. Um, there are lots of issues actually with Malaysia. For example, in, in our, my home state, yeah. we, have, we have timber, yeah. but uh, we have lots of issues with regards to timber. The logging of timber and it's creating a lot of problems. We have Cameron Highland, which is well known for its tourist destination and vegetables and, 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 and flowers, as a, uh, where we export our vegetables. But now it is experiencing a lot of, uh, it's also experiencing um, um, floods and landslides due to unregulated um, farming activities on the slopes. Uh, my state, Pahang, also have. Gold. We are rich. We have gold. But cyanide is used in the mining of gold. So it is 
responsible a lot for it in Rao and in the base, uh, fire the base. Mm. But um, all those voices are unheard because there's no leader uh, who comes forward. I do. I, since I became a, 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 an MP, I, I've been like MP for Baham. So all the problems come. But then when it is not directly related, I, I, I give my um, opinion and views about uh, whatever. Your MP or from what party? PKR. Sorry, sorry, it's not in the introduction. <laughs> sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Constituency of Kuantan. Yeah, MP, Constituency for Kuantan, which is the, the capital Baham. My constituency is the town, and it covers Tlok Jepeda and so on. Um, like, it's like the whole of Pahang will come. And it's, it's just this one voice uh, for Pahang. And then we also have issues of iron ore. Uh, we have iron ore. But then uh, it's, it's only for a short while because somehow you know, it's landed very, very quickly. <laughs> and um, the, when, when, when the issue of lightness came about, I was just recently elected at that time. I was elected in March, March 2008. And then in August, um, somebody came to me and uh, told me about this Linus plant, which has just been approved by the local authorities, to, uh, given a license to, to, to uh, be built and to later to start operating. <coughs> I wasn't aware what Linus is all about. I don't know what the uh, refinery is all about. But, um, I did my research. And the only the only thing I could relate to about rare earth was the Bukit Merah experience. I spoke to my colleagues. None of them think this is an issue. Actually, the, the Linus plant is in Gebeng. Gebeng is outside my constituency. It's in Indomakuta. The MP for Indomakuta thought that it was a non-issue about that. I, I didn't feel it was a nice issue, so I, I did more research. And uh, I, I found out more about the uh, Asian rare earth experience in Bukit Merah, where it was a Japanese company at that time uh, in the 80s, and then there was a big uh, protest about that, and people were still suffering because of the illegal dumping of the radioactive waste. Uh, and then there was uh, no guidelines whatsoever to manage the radioactive waste. So I, I felt that that is an issue because um, an Australian company wanting to set up a rare earth refinery in our backyard and a rare earth refinery will leave behind radioactive waste. That's all I know. And uh, that was when I first brought it up in, in Parliament um, in November 2008. Just a few months after I became an MP. But nobody picked it up. Nobody. The ministers just brushed it off. The media thought it was nothing. And none of the other MPs thought it was something worth mentioning or worth picking up or worth uh, debating. Um, okay. But it was still there. I was still talking about it to other people, trying to find out more. Um, but then in 2010, what happened was, there were no funders. The, uh, the, the original funders pulled out from Linus. So I thought, wow, there's a breather. There's a breather. So, so, um, we can, you know, so we don't have to worry about it so much. So if they don't have funds, so they would not be able to build the plant. But uh, late 2010, at the end of 2010, Keith Bradshaw, the, the journalist from New York Times, visited one time. And he made a point to, to, to see me. And he told me that you know they're going to new funders and that line is going to, to continue. He told me about rare earth refinery in um, in China, and he told me that the, the, the children in China have black lungs. He told me about how it was done in China and it's polluting the polluting the environment. I was very interested in all that he has to that he has to share with me. So I said to him, look, Keith, if you, want, you really want to help us, can I request that uh, you, you publish your article on the first day of parliament session? That will really help me. Mm. And he was very helpful. 
the first day of parliament session in 2011, that was after, I know he came in end of 2010, so 2011, the first day of parliament session, because he knew I spoke about it, I didn't stop, but even though the media did not pick it up much, but you know, there were some writings here and there. So in 20, uh, 2011 March, the first day of parliament session, 6th of March, uh, was the first day of parliament session, and Keith published his article on the 7th of March, 2011. And two days, two, two or three days after that, was the Fukushima incident. So, I mean, luck was in my way, even though Fukushima was not the same as, as a rare earth refinery, but radioactive and the people of Kuantan thought, ah, oh, you know, what is this? This, this can happen to us. I mean, it is quite far-fetched because Fukushima is a, a was a gamma and uh, it was a, a nuclear plant and nothing near a rare earth refinery. But when New York Times published it, the star picked it up and the star printed the, the article that was in the New York Times. So it was like one or two days after that, after the star published it, then the Fukushima event. So the whole of Kuantan was jumping. The whole of Kuantan was jumping. So two days after, after that, um, of course what I spoke, and that was my turn to debate. So it was, it was a very timely occasion because of the uh, parliament session and then uh, a speech. It was the Agung, it was a Agung debate speech. So I was able to, to use the New York Times and then to bring up the issue again and this time it really created a lot of impact. Two days later, over the weekend, I came to Guantan, I gathered at the, the, look, the only association, the organization that were willing to host me was the church. They were the ones who were willing. There was no other organization that was willing to, to, to gather people. And so, because I wanted to have a town hall. I wanted to meet Kuantan people. But um, I wanted the, the, the civil society groups to, to organize it, not just MP uh, having, having a speech, because then it would be seen as old people. I wanted the, the, the civil society groups. So it was the church group that hosted it, and then uh, I think they managed to call about 200 people within two days. And we launched the same major Stop Highness campaign at that time. And, um, and I, I'm sure from there, you must have heard what happened. It really, uh, the campaign really picked up. Um, why why uh, Linus Rare Earth Refinery is not okay? Number one, because it leaves a radioactive waste. Number two, because the ore is imported from Australia. Australia exports 100% of the ore to Kuantan. And then they extract the, the rare earth, which is used for um, hybrid cars, which is used for uh, phones, smartphones, uh, laptops. So they say that it's used for the green industry. That's their, their, their tagline. You know, it's, it's a rare earth is used in green industry. So it misleads people. And 100% of the process ore that is extracted is exported back. So what do we get? We get waste. Linus gets 12 year tax free and strategic pioneer status from the Malaysian government. It offers only 300 jobs. So what does it give us? I don't see any um, any economic um, benefits. The risk versus the benefits, there are more risk. Those were my my um, message and narratives right from the beginning. Strategic pioneer status, 12 years tax free, 300 jobs. Uh, it doesn't benefit us. The ore is from Indo uh, uh, from Australia. It's mined in uh, Mount Well. It's exported out to Fremantle, the port of Fremantle. They brought the ore from Mount Well. Um, they concentrated. They concentrated to about thirty seven percent. At that, at thirty seven percent, they pass as 
not as dangerous goods. It's just below the line. So they can transport it out of Mount Well, where they have a concentration plant then, transport it out to Fremantle, uh, and, they can, and then they, they transport it, if not as dangerous goods. They um, ship it all the way to Kuantan, to Gebeng, to Kuantan Port in Gebeng. They refine it, they leave the waste, and then they export the end product. So that's, uh, that's what they do. Later, I found out that they do actually receive a license to operate in Australia. They will give it a license. I saw the license. There are 41 commitments, and the commitments are so stringent. Amongst the commitments that they have to commit to the Australian authorities is that they have to return the waste back to the mine. So, they can only keep the waste on site for 8 days a maximum. So, they have to build railway track, they have to have a special, what they call, containers, or containers, where they, it is fully covered and which will transport the waste back to the mine and be, uh, be stored in the mine because it's classified as radioactive waste. Um, the, Malaysian, the Malaysian government just downplay the issue of the radioactive waste because they say it's low level. And then I didn't know, I had to do my research. My background is counseling psychology, I'm not an engineer, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all those um, but I have to, to do my research, stay up read and find out and I was, I was very very, I was well supported by the green MPs from Australia the university professors from Australia, people in the street who offered me information about Linus and I had a lot of information that I could Actually digest and, 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 and do something. Um, so they had to they had to build thousands of kilometers of railway tracks, gas pipelines, electricity lines, just to to have the plant in the middle of somewhere which is not near to animals, not near to people, not near to where the underground water is is uh, they don't have underground water. Basically, it's the middle of the desert. That was in 1992. The name of the company then was Ashton Rare Earth that received the license, and lines bought over from Ashton Rare Earth in 1992. And the, and the, and the license given by the Australian authorities specifically mentioned that, that they had to return the roots back to the mine. Uh, and they have to build in certain places that does not uh, affect the environment, meaning that there should be no people, no, no water underground, no animals, no plants whatsoever. And they have to build all this, and it, it was expensive for them. So they had to find a place outside Australia, which will take, which has lacks environmental laws like Malaysia, and uh, will take their their waste. Because according to the Basel Convention, according to the Basel Convention, if you export or bring out radioactive material, it will have to be returned back to the country of origin. But Linus is smart, they do not export radioactive material. They do not even export radio, uh, dangerous goods. It qualifies by the Dangerous Goods Act, just, just below the, the line. So Linus um, did a very good PR exercise. They approached scientists. They did a um, preliminary EIA, which was passed in about three weeks. And then um, the license was given in three days. The, the approval of the PEIA, the preliminary uh, EIA. Um, a, 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 a refinery such as Linus, which produces radioactive waste, is not even a prescribed activity in the EQA. So there's nothing, there's nothing that we could actually hold them to according to the law. And Linus was talking to the scientists, including, a, uh, including one MP, uh, from past with a nuclear physicist and then they gave thick documents about how Linus is contributing to the green industry and they bought it. So I had difficulties with, with, with uh, my colleagues. Those, the scientists were on their side. What do you know? They tell me, what do you know? It's safe. Linus is safe. The plant is safe. I mean, you, you just uh, make a big issue out of it. You're just politicizing it. That's what they say to me. 
it's fine, it's my conscience is crying, not politicizing it. I'm a mother and I do not want to see Kuantan to be the dumping site for radioactive waste. Initially, initially the minister said that it is not even radioactive. But I questioned him in parliament. I read about it and I said, I understand that the classification of radioactive waste is that the reading of the uh, is of the waste, the, 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 the radiation is one becquerel per gram. And I questioned the minister, is that correct? And he said, yes. We follow the international standards. International standards say one becquerel per gram is the, is the mark for um, classification of radioactive waste. Below that, it's not radioactive, and above that, it's radioactive. It's not classified as radioactive. And I told them, and I, 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 I asked him, the EIA was this thing. I had to go through it. I contacted the scientists who were involved in the Asian Red Earth. There were a few of them. I asked for their help to read through the EIA and please tell me what's in there and if there's anything dangerous. They told me their story. What story? Story is discussing origin. And then the, 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 the minister said, the scientists say, well, food, yeah, there's thorium everywhere. It's in the sand. It's a normal, occurring, radioactive material. Right. But then when you process it, it becomes tenon. Technologically enhanced, normal, occurring, radioactive material. Then it becomes different. Aha. Uh -huh. So, I didn't know what the norm is, so, so I wake up my husband in the middle of the night who happens to be an engineer. So, tell me what this is, what is this. Initially, he said, well, you know, scientifically, it may be safe, it may be okay if they do it properly. But still, no, I get this feeling that it's, it's not okay. I still have this feeling that it is, it is a dirty industry. That's the feeling I get. It is not a safe industry. I mean, technologically, you can say yes, but I still don't feel good about it. Um, and I found out that the waste is actually at 6 microgram. So I questioned the minister, is 6 more than 1? <laughs> <laughs> I know that 6 is more than 1. So he said yes. So it is classified as radioactive waste then? Yeah, he said, but it's low level. It is still low level. But it's long life. It's long life. The thorium has a half-life of 14 billion years. 14 billion years. So technically it will be there till the end of time or till the end of this year. It will be there. And, okay, and I read out about permanent disposal facilities and what are the requirements for permanent disposal facilities. There's nowhere in Malaysia that you can identify a site which, is a, which can be, uh, which can be uh, suitable for a permanent disposal facility for a uh, uh, line of space. So they will be producing tons and tons and tons. I can't remember exactly because it's five years back, you know, when we started this. It's tons and tons and tons of uh, radioactive waste. We do not even qualify under the Basel Convention because it's not transported out or exported out as radioactive material. So we start with the waste. There's no permanent disposal facility. It is stored um, in what we call the, the, the Residual Storage Facility, the RSF, which is on site, which does not have any pilings whatsoever. They're just <coughs> linings, linings lined, uh, and it, it, can, it can have leaks and it can leach into the ground. It is built on peat soil, peat soil. Um, they are... I mean, that, that area in Gaping, that's water less than a meter deep. Even in the EIA. Sorry, but it's true that Gaping always flooded, right? Mm. Yes, yes, yes. It floods a certain time of the year. And even Linus plant is always gets flooded mm. in December. Mm. And if you go in Gaping, all the plants in Gaping, you see the skirt, skirting of the buildings, there's cracks. The main building, there's no crack because they have piling, but the skirting is all cracks because of the soil. Because it's peat soil, it's soft, so it, it doesn't hold. And all these RSF, residual storage facilities, are constructed without pilings. It's just 
because it's supposed to be temporary. Then Linus wants to recycle the waste. Again, I couldn't agree to that. Do you even have the expertise to do that? Yeah, so they give funding to the University uh, 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 Pahang, you see, you see UMP, the University of Pahang. So they give a big, huge grant to do research on recycling of the waste. They want, now they want to produce soil conditioners. I'm very concerned, should they use it on our oil palm industry? It will destroy. Be scattering, it, they will be scattering the thorium everywhere. And if it gets into our food system, because, because if it leaches into the ground, it gets into the water, then the roots of the plant will absorb it, and then the animals feed on the, on the plant, yeah. and then we feed on the animals. It gets into the sea, it gets into the fish, we feed on the fish. We are a, a fishing port. We are... We are a tourist destination. I mean, this is not something that we want. We would like to see in a place which is which is like Kuantan. Uh, because I I I, I mean, as an MP for Kuantan, I want to see Kuantan develop as a tourist destination. I want to see Kuantan thrive with this kind of industry. I want to see uh, the fishing industry uh, being being established and developed because that is future and it's sustainable. And the tourism industry and the fishing industry actually it, it, it connects together because then we have the the ikan bakar, then we have the kropo, the salted fish. You know, we have kropo leko. I mean, we're proud of our our kropo leko and our ikan bakar, our and and uh, destroy everything. So I feel very protective of our local industry. Yeah, yes, and, and I think we should we should really really be protective of, of our of our coastline and um, welcome the tourists and develop uh, the, the tourism industry. We should have we should have um, eco tourism. I mean, we can go along those lines. I'm not against development. I'm not someone who's anti-development or anti-establishment, but we need the right industry. We need to develop a sustainable industry in the long term for 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 Kuantan and for Malaysia um, as a whole. So so those were my concerns, and I fought I fought very hard, and finally I think uh, more and more people joined in, and it became such a huge. Um, um, uh, opposition for 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 lightness. I was telling Madiha the other day. I was I, I went to I went to Brussels. I went to Brussels on one meeting with the at the European Parliament. I took some extra time and went all the way to Munich on my own because Siemens had, had signed an MOU with Linus because Siemens is involved in and Siemens needed Siemens needed the rep. So they signed an understanding with Linus, and Linus was supposed to to um, export, um, to be the supplier for the rare earth for Siemens. So I went to Munich all the way from Brussels uh, alone to meet uh, the management of Siemens. And I told them that, um, look, you're giving a reason for Linus to be there. Um, it's my... What I would like to say, what I said to them is that yeah, they are dumping radioactive waste in our backyard and they're doing that just to supply you the rare earth. And we're not happy with that. So Siemens, Siemens was very um, worried. So they sent a whole team of their management people to, to Malaysia. They had a meeting with me. They had a meeting with me. Uh, they had a meeting with me, and then I brought my team of experts. So, so there's about five of my side, yeah. five of the other side. So they tried to convince me, and they said, "Look, uh, we have this green philosophy. Uh, we are very committed to being green from the cradle to the grave, and we are involved in the green industry." So they talk about their green industry. So I said to them, "I don't doubt about what you're doing." Uh, with regards to the green industry. But when you say cradle to the grave, it means it also should include where you source your rare earth from. There's nothing green about lines. So when I said to them, I've got nothing against you, Siemens, 
But if you give reason for Linus to be in existence, I will fight you as I fight Linus. They went back and they cancelled the MOU. you. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I understand that they have difficulties uh, surviving, they have run out of funds, they have difficulty finding solutions for their waste, which is still on site. Their license is, to, is due to be renewed in September. The, the authorities refuse to listen. I mean, they have, they have been deaf and dumb all this, all this while to what, what, whatever opposition we have to like this. I believe that um, Linus is somehow have some sort of, what do you say, protection. Maybe there are some people who have interest, I don't know. But it's 100% Australian owned. But just to share with you that initially they, they wanted to build their plant in, 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 um, in Kamaman. <laughs> initially. Initially. But the Terengganu state government sat on their proposal because the Sahabat Alam, the Friends of the Earth, uh, came to, to the uh, Terengganu state authorities and advised them. So they were apprehensive whether they should actually give the green light to Linus. Suddenly, Linus was invited to Pahang. So they came to Pahang by invitation. Somebody invited them. Even the, the EIA, if you look at the maps that they put in the EIA, they all plucked from somewhere. It didn't even show a good cross-section of the place. So can I just chime in? Like, how to, at this stage, how involved was the Pahang state government? The Pahang state government um, refused to make any comments on it. Zero. They were very totally silent <coughs> because they say it's meaty. <laughs> It's Mitty who brought them in. It's um, Mosti, uh, Ministry of Science and uh, uh, Ministry of uh, Mosti, Ministry of Science that that uh, that uh, allowed them to operate. It's the AELB board, the Atomic Energy Licensing Board, that that gave them the license. Pahang State Government just gave them the license to construct. That's according to the state government. I mean, they're just there to give them the license to construct. So it's AELB, Atomic Energy Licensing Board, they gave them the, the, the license to operate. And MITI, the Ministry of, of Trade, that, that brought them, them in. So so state government said, you know, we just let them vote. But we have also other evidence that uh, the standards, we have evidence. I, I, I wouldn't be talking if I'm, I don't have papers or evidence with me that actually they're using China standards. They're using China standards. There are documents that I have saved that I don't have with me because I have a whole, a whole box of it. That um, initial, the initial proposal was using the China standards and according to the China standards, the classification of radioactive waste is at 32 by program. So when they initially proposed it to Malaysia, they did not classify the waste as radioactive. So they were using the China standards. Because, and, and it was clearly there, it was according to the China standards, it's 32 microgram, so the waste is at 6 microgram, so it's not classified as radioactive waste. Um, what is the plant capacity? What is the present production volume? And where are they exporting now? Okay, 24,000, I think it is 24,000 tons per year. And what is the present production volume? Half. Where are they exporting now? They're going to export to Japan now. Have they exported or they are going to export? They have started slowly. But they are not they have not reached their, their their capacity, their full capacity. So they are actually exporting already? They are already exporting. To Japan. Japan. Is Japan the only country? At the moment. At the moment. But okay, they're running out of funds. Because they have an understanding now with Japan that's funding them. They're running out of funds, they're running out of time. And there is a possibility that China may be interested. That's a possibility. That they are trying to source the fund now from China. That is why they need this uh, renewal of license. I think when it reaches full capacity, it'll be 32,000 tons a year. I mean, that's, that's what I remember. One ton is how much money? 
It depends on the price, okay. but it's a lot of money. I, I can't remember <coughs> of, of, of the cup right now, but it is a lot of money provided it because they don't pay tax. It's a lot of money. They don't pay tax. Well, if they lose money, nothing to pay. If they lose money, I think to be right, you're right. But then we are being stuck, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, actually, it is to to our interest that they 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 go, they they don't make profits. But they want the recently they they put up an advert. Well, last week they put up an advert in the uh, local newspaper showing children running happily, free by the beach, <laughs> and this uh, liners is a very friendly, caring. Uh, a, a company that is making the Malaysian children happy. <laughs> my case, you know, my residents are in content. It's just like five kilometers away from the road. So from my corner, you can see that. Uh, the blind. The blind. And we're uh, just about 500 meters away from my place. There is this small community, Malay community fishermen. They used to catch lobsters, fishes. They used to come to my place and fill the houses. Last year when we came back, we usually ordered. They said, it's normal. They don't know where it comes to. It's gone. It's so gone. basically, they are the fishermen there. Maybe about four or five boats. Near Sugai Balo, is it? Near Sugai Balo. Ah, yes. Yeah. I want to share to you with you about Sugai Balo. Okay, Linus has, <coughs> has three way streams. Three way street. Uh, um, simple in simple words, it is the solid waste, the liquid waste, and the and the gas. The gas. In simple terms. Yes. So it's uh, the 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 gas lah. The, the that goes up the 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 flue stack. Um, the the liquid waste is called the WLP, the water leak purification solid waste. And that's the one is which is classified as radioactive waste because it's six spectral program. The second one, which, which is the, the NUF, utilized underflow fluid, which is a liquid waste, it is less than one microgram. It's at about 0.4 something. It still does contain thorium and uranium though, but because it is not classified as radioactive waste, it is discharged, it is treated and discharged into the Balut River. And it is not monitored by ELB, it's monitored by the DO. So when they monitor, they just monitor the, the liquid that is discharged. But one year, I have that, I, I just sent an email to them. What are those documents? One year down after the, they started operations, under the temporary operating license, which is half the, the amount, which is about, I said 32 just now, right? Or then to, half of that, they, 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 they produce about 80,000 in the half capacity. After one year, they started operations in November 2012. After one year, in November 2020, one professor from Japan by the name of Professor Wada came and did a test on the sediments. Mm. The sediments, yeah, the mud at the at the bed of the of the Palu River. And discovered that there was a baseline, there was a baseline reading on lead, thorium, on all the heavy metals. It was very, very worrying to see that lead jumped up 90 times, 90. And this, this is published in the Journal for Environmental Science in, uh, uh, in, in Japanese. But then he showed me the data and he sh showed me the translation, you know, every column, uh, what is this, and, and I, I have that. Actually, you can show yeah. that. Uh, Adel, did you see that? The, the Journal for Environmental Science. Um, Thorium went up 27 times. <coughs> Light went up 90 times. Now now you know. Yeah. Just within a year. Just within a year. The first year of, of production, which is not full. Basically, it's just accumulation. Accumulation because it's heavy metals. Yes. So when they test, they test the water that is discharged. Okay? The, the, the liquid that is discharged. But of course, the heavy metals will, will, will sediment itself. And then when he tested on the mud, at the at the mouth of the Balut River, that's where the fishermen are. The mouth, the mouth of the Balut River. That's a small. Uh, that's a small. It's about two years because like 2015, you can still have that supply. It's still look good. Now, but last year is 2015. <laughs> it's gone. Uh, last year was another additional. Um,
an additional uh, disaster, which is the bauxite. Uh, I've yet to show you the bauxite. Yeah, we've been to the bauxite, but the ikan masin, the famous quantum ikan masin, is gone. Is it bauxite? The bauxite was even worse. Bauxite was even worse. So, so in September, who is supposed to give the approval for renewal? This, this coming, next, this, this coming week. Uh, is AELB. Right. This is uh, this is the reprinted from journal of Journal of Environmental Information Science, okay, Tokyo, and uh, written by Prof Wada, Professor Professor Yoshiko Wada. I met him when he came last year because he came to do another another to, to take another sample. I I inquired whether he has written another report on the sample that he took end of last year, but he said well he is dependent on. Civil society to give him the funds. The, um, he doesn't have the grant. What happens if he's uh, minus pay him to do it? <laughs> <laughs> Linus, of course, will not pay him to do it because it's, it, it is not to their interest. Uh, next, next one. Can you show the next, the next slide? Ah, look at this. This is in Japanese, but I, I put down, I put down the the. Uh, is there a pointer somewhere? There's a pointer. Let's show it. Yeah, so, uh, this is the Osaka baseline. Uh, this is the Balo uh, baseline reading, which is before the the date before is November twenty twelve. Okay, and then he took it one year after it started operation, which is November twenty thirteen. And then this is if you must remember that this is um, one year after. That means it is only half capacity. It's not full capacity yet. So this is Toria. Toria, uh, at the beginning it was 4 and then now it is 27 after one year. Uh, uh, this is cesium. The, the reading is part per million. The one with the heavy metal. Okay, and by the one year after. This is Toria and then this is lead. Lead, lead at the beginning was 0. PB. Lead at the beginning was 0, now it's 106. After one, part of it. You don't mind? Why do you? Can I just? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm sending straight to quantum because I told them you're here. Yeah. 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 Actually, they. I think. I think they have seen this also. But then, even this one. I. I can see. Yeah. This one. I. I brought up in Parliament. Nobody wants to answer. <laughs> don't don't Mosty said, uh, Mosty said, uh, this one, this one is not the WLF, so this is not the not the WLP. They say this is not radioactive, so it is not under Mosty. It is under DOE. DOE say what, what, what? Don't know. DOE so don't know. So nobody wants to answer this. Yeah. I question them. So, Sarah. Yeah, why me? Why any other environment? Uh, between 2012 to 2013, not that I remember because Boxite had not started. Yeah. Boxite had not started. Boxite went full swing in uh, 2015. Uh, about t in 2012, the export for Boxite was about 200,000 uh, metric tons. 200, uh, to 2014, it was about 950,000, less than, less, less than a million. Uh, in 2015, it shot up to 20 million tons of export. Mm. Oh. <laughs> That's bauxite. So I think you are real ready to move on to the next one. Yeah. On bauxite. We move to bauxite. So we just show the pictures on bauxite. Bauxite, okay, <laughs> this is another thing. Um, actually, there's bauxite uh, in abundance in 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 Kuantan. It was discovered in 1986, but uh, it was it's safely underground, and no, well, we don't know, but the PT, P, uh, the PTG, the land office would know. Ah, uh, this is the line. This is Linus Rally. Remember this? <laughs> that was in in <laughs> August. Yeah, that was in August. 20, April 2011. How many people? It's about 50,000 people. What time? What time? Kemunting. Kemunting. This is Padang Kemunting yeah. in Kuantan in 2011. Remember that March 2011 was when it was first published? Then there was people who were jumping. Within two weeks, 
the, the petition that we launched was everywhere. It was in the coffee shops, in the schools, in the banks, in the even the artists selling vegetables were passing out yeah, petitions. Yeah. yeah. So everybody was, was involved. Yeah. About the yeah. 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 So we were able to do this. <coughs> just just um it was very was it organic? Maybe like was it organic or did someone like organize these marchings to to hand out these you know these No, campaign? that one that one was not organized. It was just like we, we just printed it out. I just, yeah. I just wrote a few lines of the petition, yeah. signed it, and then we, we attached, uh, because mine was on the first page, and we yeah. attached it, and then... So, like, yeah, the campaign just naturally... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The local people themselves, the yeah. local humans, the mm -hmm. baby seller, the food mm -hmm. seller, the restaurant and all, they just take one, they just print, print, yes. print, and give up, give up. And, wow. and then I went back after, after, weekend, after I launched it, it, after yeah. I launched it, yeah. I went back to Parliament yeah. because Parliament was in session. And then the people in Guadalupe were telling me, it's everywhere. I, I, I don't believe you. I said, well, you come back, you come back next weekend and you see what's happening. I mean, I saw, I was like, really, uh, really very, very surprised that Kuantan people just were jumping up yeah. and, and everybody was involved. And you see, it's like everybody was doing it. In, in the open markets, in the coffee shops, in the schools, in the banks. And the bee, the fishermen are all involved. Very important. Mm. And that's why, that, this is what happened. Yeah, you see, see the same Malaysia uh, t-shirts. Wow. Okay. And then later, there are the organisation that we have the Impunan Hijau, the, the Green Movement, later. Um, and this is the, 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 the same Malaysia. Those are two major ones, but there are other groups, smaller groups. Um, the Stop Lightning Coalition. I have stayed clear of the, the NGOs. I am just, just uh, just acted as a link, uh, and as um, I, I, I linked with them. If they needed me, I'll be there. If they want me to say something, uh, raise issues, I'll be there. Because even I'll be making statements, and they'll also be making statements. So it was just like a concerted effort together. But being MP, I think it's always there in the front line, uh, because then we have access to all the media in Parliament and so on. So the international media came and they. At handling all this, I mean, this is nothing compared to one MDB. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So the next, <coughs> next one, the next one is is bauxite. Let me show the bauxite. So if this is what bauxite looks like, and if you think this is mass, this is not mass. So this is quite time. This was quite time in uh, 20, 2015. 2015. At least at at the worst, that was about middle of the year. Uh, it has turned red. What happened was, um, what happened because there's a demand for bauxite ore by China. Indonesia, Indonesia is, is one of the biggest supplier of the ore, but Indonesia stopped their export somehow because they wanted to. They wanted to get some environmental issues themselves and they wanted to uh, process it themselves because it makes more money. At this time, there was a real rush because there's about it costs about 50 USD per ton. 50 USD. It's a lot. So there's a real demand and China was willing to accept. China was willing to accept um, the raw or unprocessed or and and uh, that's why they and then there is loopholes in the law. We said the law does not require an EIA for mines below two hundred and fifty hectares. Our EQA only requires uh, an EIA EIA on mines above two hundred fifty hectares. So the mines are all like seventy hectares, fifty hectares. So and and most of the mines are open cast. So we just gali, 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 put it onto lorries. They transport it using license to transport laterite. So they don't need sophisticated license or whatever. They correct, correct, correct. It's open cars, is it? Correct, correct, correct. Put it onto lorries. Transport it all the way to Gebe. Okay. Most of the most of the mines are in Bukit Go. So it's in the Felda areas. So. The Felda settlers were, they lost a sustainable uh, industry. I mean, they were, they were growing palm oil. Yeah. 
here and then they throw away all their plants and allow the miners to come in and excavate and transport it. So all the way from the mine <coughs> to the port, which is about 40 kilometers, all the dust will be flying everywhere. <coughs> uh, children were having uh, problems with uh, asthma and skin disease. It, again, the two constituencies where the, it is mine and where it is stored at the port is outside my constituency. So in is it? Sorry? In whose constituency is it? One is Payrsa, Parliament of Payrsa. Separate party? BM. Okay. And the other one is Parliament in Dramakota. That is PKR, Datu Fauzi. Because uh, port is Gebek. It's the same lah. The Lupon MP was um, a guy. You know, he's... They, even my male colleagues say this to me. Fauzi, this is politics. You have to be very careful because this is not like Linus. Linus is 100% Australian. This one is local. So there are gangsters involved. There are people who are stakeholders like lorry drivers, miners, association of miners. It's all dato, dato, dato. Obviously, you've got to be very careful. They want so that's why they're not as vocal. But again, I said, I can't. I can't let the children suffer. I cannot. Excuse me, Fabi. Can I just congratulate her and thank you for you all the work? Yeah, I have to. I have to contact me. I must say, this lady, one strong person. I've been with her since 2010. Even though I'm just at the back, you will notice me. So but what you have done for us, for content people, I am sure they will never want Thank you so much. So they, they say to me, these are people with interests. They are powerful people. Careful. And then they say to me, people were just, there was a social media group set up, a Facebook by the name of Garam. People were just shouting, swearing. It didn't get anywhere, it didn't even get the media. The state government denied everything, they said everything's fine. Um, some experts came to, to do like background reading on the air pollution index, test for water in the river. They knew it's polluted, they knew it's all contaminated, but nobody there to speak. They told me of the data and said, please, you need to publish, otherwise I cannot talk about it. If you don't publish, I, I, I cannot just pluck it from the air. You know, they say, who are you, Fonsia? You're not even a, a scientist, you know? So I, I can't, I said, I don't have the, I don't have the decorum to speak unless you publish it. Like when I planned it with uh, Keith Bradshaw, please publish it, then I can talk about it. Then I can, I can, I can quote you. Nobody there. Even one, uh, even they were supposed to come out, out on air and then last minute all those programs were called off. So that's the situation and the people were just feeling so helpless. This was happening, people were just so helpless, they just cannot do anything. All they know is just to, to swear, you know, uh, in the Facebook. Let, let's show more pictures. Um, Look at this. This is the area view. Mm -hmm. This is what it looks like. As you come to Kuatan. You see? You see how they planted the earth? And then next, look at the trees. <laughs> even mango, the, mango trees. Yeah, even the, look at the trees. So it's, it's all the dust flying. Every, everything was red. Look at the trees. Look at the, the cars. This, this is what the cars look like. All the cars look like this. So sometimes, you know, they go out of Kuantan and say, oh, they created Kuantan. They know. <laughs> Look at the river. Look at the river. It's just one year difference. Yeah, in 2014, the export was, uh, remember I said less than a million tons, and then 2015 was 20 million tons. Okay? And then uh, look at the stockpiles. They put it next to the houses. There's a flat there. And then this is after the rain. You can see, it's exact, exact pictures. 
taken from different angle. And this is taken from this is inside the pot. Okay, next. This is inside the pot. Look at what they do. This is during the rain. See, these are people there, and then the rain is floods even inside the pot. Look at the stockpiles, it's all leach into the sea. And they don't have any SOP. It's like inside the pot, it's like mountains and mountains and mountains of the stockpiles waiting to be loaded onto the barges. There's no SOP whatsoever, there's no fence, there's no coverage. And it, this is what happens. This is what they do. And the wharf is flat. So after they, they, they pick this up onto the barge, they will just clean it with, uh, they will spray it with, with water, and it just leach into the sea. Okay. Then, I, I've got lots of other uh, videos, then, um, okay. then, okay, uh, before, stop that. So I was, you know, this is politics. And then those guys there were saying, were telling me, Fauzia, be careful. And then it is outside my area. It's outside my area. Kuantan Tau is blue, still blue, still green. Kuantan Tau, but outside, just around Kuantan is what you see. So, and then I have my male colleagues telling me those things. And then they said, no, no, Fauzia, you, you better be careful. And then it's also their constituency, not my constituency. But then the people were screaming. The people were coming to me and say, please la, do something. You did, you did something for Linus. You have to do this for us. So that was middle of the year 2015. So I said, give me time, let me think about it. And let me come up with a plan. So what I did first was, I gathered all the various groups, civil society groups. I called everyone that is willing to work together. This time I chair. I'm not letting go. Because I know politics will come in. And uh, it is very easy for it to die down again. Because there's some people high, high up there who doesn't want <coughs> things to get out. Because there's no data coming out. Media cannot carry the news. So nobody outside Kuantan knows unless they, go, they come to Kuantan. And then many of the representatives, some of the representatives, are willing to speak about it, but the media is not caring it. So it's got to be a strong campaign. I knew that. So I said, okay, I, I will share this uh, for, for the time being. It's very unlike like where everybody can get involved, but this time we really need to very strong, we need to lead this very strongly. So we gathered, uh, initially it was about 20 NGOs, and then it grew up, it grew and became 30. Uh, so I call all the elected reps, I say, you, even if you do not want to say much, I'll say it, but you need to support. So, and then we started all this. Uh, we started gathering, gathering data, we started to... Um, uh, we called in scientists, I engaged with 17 scientists, 17, who was willing to work with us. And then uh, we planned, these are all local scientists. We have uh, uh, water experts, marine life experts, environmental experts, and all sorts and public health. So we, we, we commissioned, we commissioned even um, a, a test on drinking water for Kuantan. Because even though, even though uh, Kuantan Town is not affected, but all those mines are upstream to our water intake points. So I did my own investigation. Go and see the water intake points, trace it up, where the mines are, what, we, what they were doing with the some of them were washing ore illegally to gain more money because when the ores are washed then um, they can fetch more money because China will pay more but some of those illegal uh, washing sites are upstream to water intake points for, well, for, which is used for our drinking water so I had some suspicions <coughs> about this and I, uh, I proposed a strategy to the group which was, which was accepted. The strategy was not to fight with the federal government, to lobby with the federal government and to get support from the federal government. Uh, point our bullets with the state government because the state government that issued a mining license. So, my strategy was <coughs> silent about the silent and then um, point our guns at the state government, use the federal government to stop the export license. So, so I was talking to the minister to stop the export license and then he said, no, mining license is to 
by the state. But I said, well, if there's no, if you cannot export, then what's the point? Nobody will want to mine because they cannot sell. So I'm hoping on the federal government, the federal minister, to actually stop the export license. There are about 34 companies that have the export license, the APs. Okay? And then, uh, the, the state government can issue as many mining licenses because they, that's what they do. But they won't be able to export. So that's the strategy. Silent about the involvement of all these people out there. But talk about facts. So, we talk about, when I talk about all this, I'm talking about, I have data. Somebody leaked the data from the DOE. And I have this data. And I found out that Mercury is level 5. I mean, whistleblowers yeah. are always willing to work with people who are willing to blow the whistle. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they come because they have the information, but they, they will not just give anyone if they don't think you are brave enough or, or you know, in a position to do something with those data. So I found out that the real water was level 5, class 5 and mercury and all sorts of heavy metals in the river. And these are at our water intake points. So we had a, a hunch about our drinking water. We were very concerned about our drinking water. And we know that uh, with regards to the drinking water, the, the, uh, the, 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 the community will start to, to feel, to, to jump. No, but the, surprisingly, what you, what you saw was not enough to make Kuantan people jump. It, they were so cool. They were so cool. We could not organize any rallies. <laughs> you, you, you'd be very, very surprised. And then it became, some, it became quite a racial issue at one stage. They, they say, look, you know, why was it with, uh, with, with Linus everybody jumped? Why is it with uh, uh, with box like nobody went to the streets? Because there's so many people who are who are benefiting, <laughs> who are benefiting. So and you know how societies work, you know. So even politicians were afraid. So again, I was at the front, uh, at the front line. And they said, oh, yeah, you lose your votes." I said, "Well, for me, people's lives are more important." I'm not politicizing this issue. It is an issue of our the future of our children, and I think I think even if I lose, I know my conscience will be very clear that I've done whatever I need to do for the people and for the country. So I persevere and I continue with what I need to do. So next, and, and there's lots of this, and I I brought a campaign from the issue uh, the media not not covering it to make it into an issue which is nationally. And internationally, uh, it became an international issue. And then we proved that there's toxins in our water, there's lead in our water. Because, and then they question, well, so how do you do? How, what is the methodology? Oh, we got uh, one of those experts, Professor Maktab from UDM. He came voluntarily and we paid for the test. We raised the funds. It was not, I could not even raise the funds, 5,000, to pay for the lab. It was so difficult compared to Linus. Linus was hundreds of thousands of but with the case of Boxer, it was so very, very difficult. And then finally, the, the media came to our assistance because you know, they was, it was like, was in, in parliament. They saw the minister was working with me because I, uh, but we are lucky because the minister, the current uh, environment minister is from Sarawak. Ah, uh, so he doesn't know any. He doesn't. He doesn't come from a state which has. Yeah. yeah. So, and, <laughs> so and this, this, I use it to his yes, advantage. And and he wanted to leave a legacy. He wanted to leave a legacy. So so it was quite easy to work with him. But provided that you know we come up with uh, concrete uh, suggestions and he. He was very cooperative and we had very good parliament debates and he will answer all my questions in parliament and, and the media pick it up after that. And well, this, is, this is later, at this near the end of the year. Remember at the middle of the year it was like no go and then we formed the coalition and I was able to speak. Because being the chair of the coalition gave me that, that mandate.
to speak because otherwise it's like, oh, it's not your area you know why if the, even the MPs are not saying anything about it and you know? why are you making such a fuss so being the chair gave me that that uh, legal mandate to, to talk about it and to lead so far uh, this is the minister so it's all confirmed and then uh, we were praying that there is no flood because if there's floods can you imagine all the red mud in people's homes, which is toxic? So we pray that there will be floods. And God was lucky. <laughs> God, was, God was kind to us. So we were very, very lucky. We did not have the floods. But we had three days of rain. Narayan, uh, this is what happened during the three days of rain. Narayan, the video do? Let's show the video. Three days of rain. Eh? No, no, this is his... Uh, no, the 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 sea, the sea. Yeah. That, that's the, the way I was telling you about, about that 20, that now 30 organisations that have joined. So that Kabunga, you know how we got these pictures? By Drew. Mm. Ah. By Drew. And that's when, after three days of rain, that's what happened. And the sea became red. And that's when the port authority said, it's got nothing to do with the port. Because I was pointing in their direction, because I said it's because due to the stockpiles being stored. And then, of course, with three days of rain, it will all flow into, into Sungai Pumora because Sungai Pumora is where uh, all of the uh, all of the leche goes into the that Sungai Pumora and it goes to the sea from the port. There's millions of tons of uh, about three millions at one time of stockpiles in the port. So and it proved it, you see. So they said no, it's got nothing to do with the bauxite. But then that drone pictures Sungai Pumora. So I right, show the picture of the MP. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> he said to me, he said to me, you give me the date, It's good because this is side, like skateboarding <laughs> press, and they show a picture of him like this. Yeah, because he he was really, I think he is under pressure, because uh, when people apply and these people are high up, so and his political uh, existence depend on these people, so he has to issue a mining license. And then due to greed and corruption, uh, there's no um, enforcement of whatever little procedures there are. And then uh, people were greedy, they wanted to make as many trips as possible. At one time there's thousands of lorries on the road. If the, the, if the operation time is from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., they will operate till midnight. So there's, and every time there's an operation by JPJ or, or SPAD, the road will be clear. There are informers to tell them that, you know, there's somebody there at the roadblock. So, and then, the moment the, the, the JPJ or the SPAD close their, their stop their operations, <laughs> then the road will be full again. So they try to make as many trips, because for the lorry drivers, it's a lot of money. They want to make as many trips, because once they get to the port, they have to queue. So they will want as many trips. They did not bother to service their lorries. There was once in one instance where the tire from the lorry flew and land on the Myvi on the other side, and one English teacher died on the spot. Yes, that really hurts the Quantan people. We will be so sad. I mean, she's an English teacher, and she. I mean, Quantan is a small community. Everybody knows everybody, and it was so. Sad. 
tragic. And that happened. Most of the lorry drivers are from outside because we don't have enough lorries to, mm. to, 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 to transport all of those uh, bauxite to the port. But uh, they say to me, Fauzia, those lorry drivers, they are your voters. <laughs> they voted for you, they supported you. Uh, miners came to me and said, we supported you. They threatened me, they supported you. Uh, but this is what you do to us, we know what to do to you next time. So I say to them, look, I'm doing this for your children. I'm not against development. I just want a sustainable development. I just want stricter laws, better SOPs. Bauxite mining can be a sustainable mining. It can be done. It has been done in other countries. Why do we need to do this? And I, I, say, I appeal to them. This is where being a serving psychology as a background comes to my advantage. <laughs> And I said to them, I appeal to them, look, with your money. I'm fighting for your children. You must stand on my side, not against me. You know, appeal to them, rather than, rather than uh, succumb to their, to their pressure. And they actually, they, it opened up to quite better discussions because the miners made a point to talk to me. They called me and they presented to me better procedures. Some of the big mines, they are better because they should, they have procedures to clean the lorry, the tires, cover the, the lorries so that the, the dust does not fly. So it's the smaller, the smaller miners that, that are the culprits. But then there must be a mechanism to, to, to monitor everything. There must be alternative routes. And we're talking about alternative routes. We're talking about uh, storage facilities. You, know, you just cannot just leave it like that. We're talking about um, transporting the, uh, uh, the, the stockpile onto the barges. I mean, uh, when you carry it from, from the stockpiles onto the barge, there must be a procedure for that. There must be um, detailed EIA on future mines. It must not be upstream of water intake points. All those, those things, those are the things that I would like to see in place and uh, properly uh, uh, outlined, yeah. then I'm not against bauxite mining to say. So I think they, they understood what I was trying to say. So they tried to, to show uh, the, whatever procedures that they're using. But still, okay, our achievement was this. A moratorium was announced. Yeah, a moratorium was announced from January to March, uh, from January to April. And then just before the end of the moratorium, uh, what we did was we walked. We walked to Parliament, about 350 kilometers. It was difficult finding the people, but they were, <laughs> we walked. <laughs> okay, 17 days. It took us 17 days. And we walked, and by the time we reached Lango, we had the support from Lango State Government, then we walked to Parliament. There was a huge crowd by the time we reached Parliament. From when, when we started in Pantai, it was just like a handful of people. So people joined us along the way, gave us flowers, you know, gave us food, gave us shelter, and we walked again. Uh, I'll be making my, uh, my uh, trips back and forth, uh, uh, watching them, and then uh, going back to Parliament. And, and then finally, when they reached Parliament, they handed over the, uh, the memorandum to the minister, and the order was extended. So the Red to Green movement was, was formed. Uh, red was about sign, and we wanted to make it green, so we call it the Red to Green movement. Okay, so uh, the moratorium was extended. Uh, all right. uh, and then it was extended again for the third time. This is the second time it was extended until July uh, because, um, because the stockpile was not cleared. They, they failed to meet the deadlines by the first moratorium, the second moratorium. Now it's extended to the third moratorium until the middle of September. But uh, I heard that the, 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 sh the ships are all lining up in the port. I just received a message yesterday that the ships are lining, waiting for the middle of September to start uh, again. But anyway, I also say that let's, I want to see the procedures, the SOP, before you start, <coughs> middle of September. Next. Ah, <laughs> somebody did this. It's a, <laughs> it's a Jedi. It's a fighting. <laughs> Funny. But anyway, uh, I think I've come to the end of the presentation. Nine years, I've had my fair share, more than my fair share. 
and in fact the bigger the big the big flood was also one time in 2013. It, I I pointed I actually pointed, predicted this to happen because uh, sometime in 20 2010 I had some documents which showed that they were taking away all the the the, the timber upstream. I said we will have problems with uh, we will have floods because we are a basin. One time is a basin, so you take away the log up there, the timber up there, then you don't follow procedures, and you know how they did it. They just pass in excommunication parcels, parcels which is uh, not connected. But over a period of two and a half years, when you connect it together, it becomes huge jigsaw puzzle. Who don't see that? It's a huge area all joined together. But when they approve it, it was just separate. Mm -hmm. Then next month, they approve three more separate mm -hmm. parcels. Mm -hmm. But it's all jointed together. So smart, you know, like London. Yeah. <laughs> so I pointed it out. I made a press statement. I pointed out the parliament. And then I said, we will have major floods that, that we will not be able to cope with. And I'm sure you, you may, many of you may have seen that video that went viral. When I stood out in Parliament and asked for the Arura emergency to be declared because 30,000 people had to leave their home overnight and 30,000 families were, were left uh, with that, oh, it was 100% total loss. 30,000 families. It was, it was the end of the 2013. And then when I stood up in Parliament, I didn't sleep the whole night because I have been receiving all this information about people leaving their homes going through wading through water that is up to their up to their um, chest and babies being put in the uh, basins and then brought through the water and then the J Palm or this bomber will not pick up people because they were not instructed to pick up people, they were just instructed to monitor. And uh, throughout the night I was receiving this news. The first thing next morning I stood up and asked for a verbal emergency motion to declare emergency so that the whole troops will come and, and, and uh, give assistance. But the BNNPs laughed at me. And then they say, Fuzia, if your place is flooded, go home. Why are you doing that? And I said, I'm the only one who can speak up and ask for an emergency move. There are lots of other people who can really physically go and, 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 and help, but then I need to get this motion through. That went viral. That guy was going to die. That went really violent. The, group, the people at one time really felt very really hurt because even the Amno people felt very really hurt because uh, the Amno guys were having their AGM at that time. So none of the Amno leaders were there. And then I was appealing for help and pushed through an emergency motion. And then they laughed. And then even when there was not enough, we were not prepared for that uh, quantum. Uh, every centre was prepared only for about 500 people to have to receive 500. But it, the numbers were so huge that there was about 3,000 to 5,000 in one centre. So they slept on the floors for three days and three nights. And there was not enough food and there was not enough... Uh, that, there was no capacity to deal with that kind of, of uh, numbers. Uh, that was even before Kelantan had their big class, you know. One time had hours first in the end of 2013. So, okay, I think uh, I, a lot of it is due to the environment. Yeah. And Kelantan, I have data which showed that it's also due to the clearing up of the, of the forest. Because they use the excuse to clear up the forest and to do hutan ladang. Mm -hmm. These are hutan simpan kekal, you know, forest reserve. So, for a reserve, you cannot, you cannot touch, right? But they clear it, the law allows for it, but they replace it with hutan nada, agricultural forest. But all this will take time, right? You want to plant uh, pokok apa, pokok getah ke, geharu ke, it will take time. So when they remove it, they did not follow the procedure, they just remove everything. Greed, eh? Greed. Greed and corruption, when you put it together, it's very dangerous. But then when they reply, it will take time to grow. So that's why they have it. And in, in, in Kelantan, I have the, the, the Sabah Alam showed me the data. It's about 200 times the, the allowable amount. Mm -hmm. So then you saw the huge flood in Kelantan in 2014, end of 2014. 
So right. So those are environmental issues in Malaysia. So <laughs> we've got about um, we've got about five minutes on and off for questions. Any questions? Any concerns? And yeah, uh, I'll take three at a time. So Danish, Sue. Uh, we'll start with Sue. Uh, it's uh, great to see that you're fighting uh, a cause that is very much hidden in our uh, level. But I have to say, uh, I know you are for sustainable development, but even within the opposition ranks, especially from my home state of Penang, development for the sake of development is very, very strong concept over there. Uh, there, is, there is no clear idea who is responsible for a lot of clearings. Uh, creating all the Bota kills in Penang. Um, then also you had this massive reclamation. Yes, PKR has been forefront in trying to slow down and stopping it, but it's, I have to say your partner DAP doesn't, doesn't seem to grasp the environmental concern as much uh, as you would do. How would you, how would you tackle this with your colleagues? Sorry. Thanks so much for your work. Um, you mentioned about the EQA not being uh, mentioning about these things. What are the changes to the EQA there are uh, in the past two years regarding about fossil oil and mining and red? All right. Any other questions? Yeah. Um. Open to one more question. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes, Danish. I I understand what you say. I say this. The two, the two true tests, whether you are a true reformist, is when you get into power. <laughs> I discussed this with, with my DEP colleagues too. I mean, it's a real true test. Because when I was telling you about my colleagues who didn't say much, because you know, they we use our words and so on. It's a real test for you, when you are there in a position to do something, and you are being, you have this challenge in front of you, and you need to make decisions. And that's when that's when either you pass as a true reform miss at heart and willing to, to bring about the changes or you pull back and succumb to the normal way of doing things. I think even in the EP there there are some there are some environmentalists amongst them and there are some reformists amongst them who are also questioning their, their uh, senior leaders. I think in, in, in uh, my party, we are very thankful that our senior leaders like Anwar Ibrahim, uh, Wan Aziza himself give me a lot of support in what I'm doing and, and, and they give me a lot of freedom to, to actually lead or campaigns like Boxside and so on. And also to speak up with regards to, it. I mean if there's any issues uh, with regards to Salamu. Uh, I mean, Elizabeth would be very, 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 very worried if I start asking her the questions. But I think Elizabeth has have done quite well also, which is quite careful about the things that, that we do. I mean, when, when Slangor we came to do the government, we stopped. Take, um, we did not touch any of the forest reserves for for Utara, not even one acre, since we came into the government. So we are very careful about those things and. <coughs> There's certain laws about building on hill slopes and so on. So uh, that's with regards to, I mean, at the end of the day, the test is when you get into power. I mean, we, we have to continuously remind ourselves that we want to be reformed. And, and, and we have to continue with those reforms. Uh, and, and that's the purpose of, of wanting to get into power. That's the whole reason we want to get into power, so that we can bring about the changes. Yeah, because we don't agree with the end for so many things. So we need to change. And when we get into power, we have to do the right things. Of course, environment may be last in the list. It's not the top most priority, but I think it's time to change. It's time to bring it up. and, and uh, Because for me, it's a very important agenda. Because it's about the future, it's about the children, it's about the future generation. It's the earth. We only have the earth, you know. How much money can you give? How much money can you pass down to your children? It's, it's this, this world and the, the earth is, is what we hand over to them. And, and I think that all of us should, should really hold to it very dearly. So, with regard to the EQA, um, now the, uh, the, the radioactive uh, processing of radioactive material and uh, 
radioactive waste management is only a prescribed activity. Mm -hmm. And it needs a detailed EIA now. And there's also guidelines for managing radioactive waste. But in order to accommodate liners, they have included one line. It says that it is okay to recycle radioactive waste. So they had to, 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 to add that one liner to accommodate liners. But there are some changes. Uh, and uh, with regards to bauxite, there has also been uh, there was a circular uh, what they call it percolating alam skita, which is amendment that now there is no minimum acreage for uh, mining license. That means before it was 250 hectares above, now there's no minimum acreage. There must be a DI done on those. So those are breakthroughs. Those are breakthroughs. And, but then, it doesn't work retrospectively. Mm. Uh -huh. So the existing mines, the licenses for the existing mines will be, um, will be in operation until the beginning of the year, next year. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to push until the license expire, <coughs> so that they will have to fresh apply for fresh license and then they, they have to do the EIA. But we'll see lah because it's September already, you know, October, November, December. So we one more moratorium, <laughs> <laughs> and then they will have to do the the, the EIA. Then then the EIA itself, the de well, it's a detailed EIA, so they will have to be very careful lah. They cannot do it upstream, uh, to water intake points, water catchment areas, and then near the homes. And also, there are lots of illegal mines. You know what they do? They encroach on people's land. So it, because there's lots, lots of bauxite. So if there is a piece of land and then it's vacant, nobody's there, the owners are in KL, suddenly, you yeah, got excavators inside there, you know, people just <laughs> <laughs> taking the bauxite out in the middle of the night. Yeah, no, Danish, you look at me like so surprised. Yes, that's the truth. It happens. Oh, very, 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 very entrepreneurial. <laughs> yeah. Is it true that once Sorry. you have the bauxite mining, you can't sort of use that land for agricultural reasons? And okay, in an open cast mine, what you need to do is that you need to remove the topsoil, put it aside, and then excavate, take out the, the ore, and then cover back and put back the topsoil. Then only you can rehab. Yeah. But what they did was, they just threw everything. They did it so fast, they threw the trees, they threw the topsoil away, and then they, they excavate the, 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 the ore, and then now there's about 10 meters deep holes. Where will they find the soil to cover it? So nobody's bothered about rehabilitation. So the feathers, uh, they, they are the palm oil, the oil palm foundation is gone. Gone. The estates is gone. gone. Forever, and, and then some of the miners don't even pay them full amount yes, because they say it's inferior quality. And then the state government now is uh, going to sue them because they're not legal mines. So they're in double jeopardy. So initially when I came, they threatened me you know, because I am the cause of them losing their livelihood. But I braved myself. I met them. And then they were very angry with me, shouted and so on. But again, uh, the psychology. Uh. <laughs> so I said to them, talk to them nicely. And then finally, now they call me, please lah, help us lah. You don't know what to do with it. Because they, they were cheated. Because they, they, okay, $50 per ton, export value. 9 ringgit per ton from the Felda owners. 9 ringgit. Fifty dollars US town export value. Mm. So, so what are you getting? Rahim had a question. Yeah, so I was gonna ask, so in Malaysia, right? So once you've mined, do you then once you've exhausted the reserves, do you forfeit the land of <coughs> the state? Uh, okay, there's some new laws that uh, because the the what is the land may belong to you. But underneath that belongs to the state. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is the new law. No, it's the same here. This is a new law that the parliament has just passed. Before this, there's no law. So they can get away with it. Before this. Before this there was no there was no guidelines or whatever uh, legal document that say what's underneath the earth uh, belongs to the state. Uh, before this there was I mean, if it's your land, it's yours. But now that is it's a new law that has been um, 
the unstable land so, stuff. So even though you have mined the land, you have exhausted the resources, you still own the land? You still own the land. But then you need to rehab the land. And nobody is taking the responsibility. So this so felder owner does not have there. the funds, they don't have the money to rehab. So they're looking in every direction. They look at felder, felder say, who told you to sell? And they look at the miners, the miners say, yeah, there was nothing in the agreement. Mm -hmm. And I had copies of the agreement. It didn't say anywhere. But those people were greedy, you know, quickly signed. Mm -hmm. Put 10,000, 20,000, not enough, 50,000. Not enough, uh, the brokers would just put some more in front of you what you sign. Some of the children who work in KL, they come back and their fathers have already let go of the land. So, nobody to advise. Uh. Kesian. Very sad for them. There's about 263 owners. Felda, Felda, so, all owners. small owners? All small owners, owners. yeah. Some of them give total 110 uh, acres. Because all of them have 10 acres, <coughs> some of them give total 10 acres. Some of them give the 5 acres. You know, 5 acres, so they have another 5 acres. La. But then, can you imagine, uh, if you cannot farm on 5 yeah, acres, yeah. if it is surrounded by holes, mm. yeah. lakes, uh. so so even, even when it rains, yeah. it's, it's, it's uh, will be lakes. Mm. So it's difficult. And if you go to Felda Bukit, go, you feel so bad, because it's so dusty, and so red, and it's so bad. Just, yeah, one last question. Mm. Sorry. Um, given that you worked so hard on the environmental question, which is basic, basically confined to Pantan area of Ahan, can you see a bit of an awakening on the east coast of Malaysia about environmental issues? Because water is a precious um, commodity that has been used really moving. And I know in, in the east coast, a lot of logging had now you know, um, depleted the forests in that area. The main range also is going. So, wait, how how do you see the situation politically, relation, environment overall? Given your incredible you know work you've done um, in Bahan, I think we are a long way away. I think we are a long, long way away because people still throw rubbish all over the place. We have difficulties with separation of separating our, our rubbish, our our household um, waste. waste. Uh, we have difficulty trying to explain to them about recycling and so on. Solar power? Oh, solar power. <laughs> <laughs> We're dealing with the IPPs that is uh, producing excess capacities more than the normal average and charging us. <laughs> and, uh, and then, um, uh, how do we talk about going for alternatives? Or renewable? When the... <coughs> Government is so happy with awarding IPPs and paying for them. A long no way in terms of policies, in terms of practice, in terms of mindset, culture. Oh, yeah, there's a long, long way to educate our people. Yeah. So, yeah. There's yeah. a question. Yeah. With all this happening, and <clears throat> I'm sure the rural communities are suffering in some form or another. Mm. When are they going to wake up and realize? At the end of the day, change can be happen, and the fact that change. Correct. <laughs> I, I lament about the same thing also. But the rural community have access only to mainstream media, which is TV1, TV3, which is highly censored, and only, only one perspective. They don't have uh, access to alternative media and thus their minds are not open to alternative views. So they have been <coughs> subject to that indoctrination by the mainstream media for so long. And it's very convenient by the present government to keep the people poor so that they can be indebted forever. They receive green, yeah, the Bantuan Rakyat, Satu Malaysia, which is less than a thousand a year for one household, which comes to about three ringgit per day, which is only one dollar or for single students. And yet they're so inducted to have AMNO to keep AMNO in power. Mm. Otherwise, at the end of the Malays, I mean, they, they, they have been led to believe that, and uh, they have believed that for so long, it's not easy to bring them out. Yeah. Um, I think we'll have to end at, on that note. 
Uh, thank you so much, YB. Uh, you've been a tremendous, iconic figure for environmental activism in Indonesia. There's literally no one else like you, and I hope you know that. And I, <laughs> and I, I hope you, you remember that, and we here support you as always. So let's give a round of applause.